creation of the world, God loved us. In the warmth of a sunrise, in the rainbow after a storm, through signs and wonders, promises and dreams, he showed his love through the law, through judges and prophets and kings, through floods, famines, furnaces, and fish. He parted the waters, led nations to new lands, closed the mouth of lions, and rained down fire from heaven. But in all that he had done, we still did not understand the great mystery of his love. So he did something we never imagined. He grew silent. But in the silence, he was preparing us. The world awakened to the very presence of God on a quiet night in Bethlehem. The earth shook with a heavenly host, announcing the good news that would change the course of eternity. God's only Son, perfect and holy, would come down to dwell among us. But how would he come? A brave warrior like Joshua? A triumphant king like David? A bold prophet like Elijah? No, in God's infinite kindness, he chose a humble baby, our infant God, here with us. This is the mystery of Christmas. And now, our hearts are bursting with joy, like the star that scattered its light across the night sky. Our voices ring out in praise. We join with the angels and sing. This divine gift of God, asleep on the hay, has come. A gift of love for you and for me. What a glorious mystery. Amen. Good morning and a happy Christmas. Merry Christmas from my side and on behalf of the staff and the pastoral team here at Rosebank Union Church. So good to see you. Thanks for coming this morning, especially those of you that were dragged along here. And uh, I remember what it was like before I was a Christian. We had a neighbor that would invite us every year to Christmas services. My standard answer was just no. That was the answer of my family. So you've done better than I have in that you're at least here this morning, but you can see so am I. So something must have happened in between. God's grace met me. And uh, now, now Christmas Day is a working day for me. So thanks for being here. As I think about Christmas, I'm always reminded of a story that, that kind of is really bizarre and it kind of is, has always kind of just unsettled me. Uh, it was three weeks before Christmas of 1993 and a man by the name of Wolfgang Dirks died while watching TV. Now, our neighbors in his apartment complex in Hamburg, Germany, hardly noticed the absence of this 43-year-old because for the next five years, his rent continued to be paid automatically out of his bank account until the money ran out, and that's only when people began to notice. So five years later, his landlord then knocked on his door and went in to inquire as to what was the problem, and there he found Wolfgang Dirks' skeleton sitting in his favorite armchair in front of the TV. His TV guide was open on his lap to December the 5th, five years prior, the presumed day of his death. His TV had already burnt out and probably due to German engineering, his Christmas lights were still twinkling away. So, <laughs> need to find out what brand those were. But it's a bizarre story that doesn't sit with us really well. It's, it's, it's maybe a, a good commentary uh, on particularly the Western world because probably largely in the Western world where we are maybe more individualistic and disconnected from people, it's possible that every year hundreds if not thousands of people die in isolation. And their bodies are only discovered sometimes days, weeks, even months after their demise. And I've often said to myself, if Wolfgang Dirks could be that alone in his death, then how alone must he have been in his life? 
I think loneliness is more common than we think. It's probably the common fact of our human existence. Thomas Wolfe, the famous American novelist, writes, the whole conviction of my life now rests upon the belief that loneliness is the central and inevitable fact of human existence. And he writes that in a short essay, I think it's called God's Lonely Man. How ironic that the, 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 the busier and the crow- more crowded the world gets, the more isolated we feel. The more we embrace social media and technology and the advances which we love and enjoy, somehow the more disconnected we feel. And there's something I believe far deeper going on. Loneliness is not solitude. Solitude can be something good. Hands up those of you that are introverts. Well, obviously no hands went up. Hands up those of you that are extroverts. See, they just shot up there. But those of us that are introverts, we know that, that we draw energy from being on our own. And uh, I'm a bit of a mix of both, so I enjoy a good party, but I also need to recharge my batteries on my own. And if we uh, sometimes have the privilege of going down to Durban, I can just sit on a lone rock for days on end and just, I don't know, the batteries just get recharged. Uh, And maybe that's you. But you see, loneliness is not solitude because solitude uh, can be something good in the busyness of our lives just to kind of disconnect a little bit and you know, listen to a great song somewhere or read a poem or just watch a sunset or go for a walk. Those are things that we enjoy. And solitude is being alone by choice. But lonely is being alone not by choice. But loneliness is also not isolation. Here we are in this massive room. There's a crowd of people. Uh, You'll be at your Christmas lunch. There'll be people all around. So it's not isolation. You can actually be amongst people, amongst the crowd, and yet still somehow feel alone. That there's nobody that really understands this morning, nobody that really gets you and gets what's going on in your life. I think back on Robin Williams, one of my much-loved actors and comedians, and, and I trust for you as well who took his life in 2014 and such, yeah, just circumstances that I think left those of us that that loved him shocked. And this is what he said. I used to think the worst thing in life was to end up all alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is to end up with people who make you feel alone. And I mean, Robin Williams, more than anyone else, was the life of the party. He was, I suppose, the the typical clown who himself was, was bleeding inside but making us laugh on the outside. I think no one could have lived a more party-filled life than the Swedish DJ Avicii, Uh, and I'm another great fan of his, and we were out the other night, and wherever you go in this season, you hear his music pumping, and uh, he, he wrote this song called Lonely Together, but then ended up taking his own life last year in 2018 by cutting himself with a broken wine bottle. His family said in a statement after his death, He really struggled with thoughts about meaning, life, happiness. He could not go on any longer. He wanted to find peace. And so I find it ironic that that maybe his hit song, Lonely Together, was something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is what the lyrics say of his song, Lonely Together. I might hate myself tomorrow, but I'm on my way tonight. At the bottom of the bottle, you're the poison in the wine. I might free myself tomorrow, but I'm on my way tonight. Let's be lonely together a little less lonely together. And I think there's some truth in that, that sometimes in the busyness of life, we're with people, but, but there's still a loneliness, and all we can say at best is, well, let's be a little less lonely together. Because we all just wanna be loved, we all wanna be accepted, we're all looking for approval, we, whether it's from a boss, or whether it's from a dad, or whether it's from a mom, or whether it's from friends, or whether it's from a, a partner. We, we just wanna know that we're valued. We, nobody wants to feel that their life is worthless and unnecessary. No one wants to feel unneeded. But I think our loneliness is a symptom of something far deeper. And in my pastoral experience, I think there's two feelings that just won't seem to go away. Two feelings, and in the moments when you're honest enough about your loneliness, and you really say, yes, if I'm honest, there's a, a deep loneliness. I've got people and I feel satisfied and I'm happily married, whatever it is, but there's, a, there's another deeper loneliness. I think you know that there's a relationship that you don't have that you're supposed to have. And that first feeling is someone's missing. Someone's missing. And maybe you think it's a best friend. Maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a partner, a husband or a wife or having a close family. But every relationship, even the healthiest marriage, we know that there's no such thing as a perfect relationship. 
And even in perfect relationships, we still sense, hey, I'm, 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 I'm looking for, for, for something. There's a hole. We spend our life looking for someone or something that will make us truly happy. Even the late Michael Jackson once confessed, I think all my success and fame, I've wanted it because I wanted to be loved. That's all, that's the real truth. I wanted people to love me, truly love me because I never really felt loved. And I think it's true even of those of us that have given us, given up on ever finding love. And maybe you're here this morning and you're cynical and you say, well, I, I have been searching for the perfect relationship. It doesn't exist and uh, I've been in and out of relationships and now I, I, I'm just fine on my own. I don't need somebody to be happy to complete me. Well, Sarah Moses writes a New York Times column called Modern Love. And this is what she writes. I tell myself that I don't need a partner to lead a happy and fulfilling life. Then one morning I'm on the train across from a cute couple. He says something funny to her and she laughs, then puts her head on his shoulder. When they get up to leave, he holds her hand and they just look so stinking happy. That's what she says, stinking happy. I wanna cry, feeling creepy for staring at these strangers and also envious that they seem to have what I want. That's honesty. That's honestly saying that the first feeling is somebody's missing. But then secondly, there's the other feeling, and that's that something's wrong. We just can't quite put our finger on it, but there's something wrong. There's something wrong with the world. There's something wrong with the people around us. And I know that because you're going to their Christmas lunch, and some of those family members are really, really weird. There's some pe weird people around us. We all have those people in the family. We have to invite them. We wouldn't have, but they're family, and they'll be there at lunch and it might be you. <laughs> but we also sense that there's something wrong with me, if we're honest. We, do, we, we sense that, we, we set the goals, but we, we always seem to fall a little bit short of our, our goals. There's something wrong with the world. There's brokenness, and there's pain, and there's disease, and there's hurt, and there's, there's a selfishness, and the, as much as we try and, and, and bring in a utopia, worlds, the world remains at war. There remains conflict in homes. Something isn't right, but we just can't seem to find it or fix it. So someone's missing and something is wrong. But what is that sound? Can you hear it? Listen. It's the sound of Christmas. It is the sound of heralding angels, declaring, as Matthew tells us in Matthew 1.23, that the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us into the midst of our silent night, into our brokenness, into our missingness, into our emptiness, God speaks. After 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God breaks the silence and he breaks it to Mary and he breaks it to us. God with us. And Mary is astounded and shocked. And in the account where we read about Mary, which isn't in Matthew, but in Luke, the first words that she utters are, how can this be? How will this be? Mary knows that God is great, that he is above, that he is holy. How can this be that God would condescend and come to me? She knows herself. She knows God and she knows herself. She's just a young virgin. She has no experience. She's small. She's humble. She herself needs God, a savior. God with us, God born in me, someone's missing. And we discover at Christmas that it's God and here he is in a manger. And we discover that something's wrong, that God has made the initiative to come to us because our sin has separated us from God. Our sin is the cancer that has destroyed this relationship that we've enjoyed with God. Isaiah 59 says, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. It's God who's been missing from our lives and we've lost our mooring. We've, we're, we're just floating out at sea and we, we're trying to find our way home and we never seem to be able to find our way to that safe harbor. God is the relationship that we've been searching for, but maybe this morning, like Bono, you say, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Our sin is the disease that has infected and killed our relationship with God and our rebellion is like a wall that has separated us from God. We can't climb over it, we can't go around it, we can't dig beneath it. And so God has broken through that wall at Christmas 
And deep down, if we're honest this morning, there's a faint longing for Eden. We sense that we were made for Eden and all these little things we taste along the way, these beautiful flowers, they've just been sensed of a place that we haven't yet fully visited. But it reminds us of home, a home that we know we have lost. There have been tastes that we are hungry for God and yet here God has come to us, God with us. And Mary is overwhelmed. Who's gonna believe her? What about this love she has for Joseph? That's gonna be destroyed when Joseph finds out. Her community is gonna shun her. God with us feels like such an unbelievable concept to us. And no doubt to Mary in some measure as well. And here she is, she finds herself pregnant, pregnant and alone, and she knows that she has not been with any man. And so Mary hurries away from the crowd. She needs to get away from it all to be alone with her relative Elizabeth in the hill country. And Luke tells us that Elizabeth too became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. So Mary in the midst of her aloneness says, let me get alone, let me get that solitude so that I can process what's happening here. And maybe you need to process that too. You come in here and you say, this seems unbelievable. Maybe you need time to process. And like the wise men, I wanna encourage you, begin that journey. The wise men didn't know what they would find at the end. They had doubts, they had questions along the way, but they began the journey. And maybe that's you, just begin to seek, ask the right questions, talk to the right people. She begins to grasp what it means for God to be born in her. And then she pens a beautiful Christmas song, which I wanna read to you from Luke chapter one, it's a beautiful Christmas song. Here's Mary's song to us and for us. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Friends, you may think that this song It's just a song that applies to Mary. But in verse 54, she said, this isn't my song alone. It's for Israel, it's for Abraham, it's for all of his descendants, which means that Mary's song can be your Christmas song as well this Christmas day. And Mary's song, if we to distill it down to two main things, is really about God and about us. About God and about us. And and yes, we may believe in God, and yes, we believe in ourselves, but the thing that bridges this, that, that blows our minds this Christmas is the little word with that God is with us. And if you know God, he shouldn't be with us, and if you know us, he shouldn't be with us, but yet here sits the word, God with us. So let's look at God from Mary's song. Number one, God. Verse 46 and 47, Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. This entire song is saturated with God. More than a dozen times, Mary mentions God. She's caught up with God, she's moved to worship. She describes his attributes, she says he's the mighty one, he's performed mighty deeds, he's powerful, holy is his name, he is separated, he's set apart, he's completely uncontaminated by sin. What God who is perfect in holiness would want to associate with sinners? And so she begins to think about God, uncontaminated, sinless and perfect, and yet she says, because of this news to her and to us, His mercy extends to those who fear him. We would know nothing, very little, of God's mercy if it wasn't for the manger. We don't deserve mercy from a holy God, and yet Mary says God is merciful. And then she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. To magnify means to increase or to make great. You can't make God greater than he already is. So what is Mary saying? She's saying when we worship, when God is born in us and we become worshipers of him, God is magnified in our lives. He becomes greater, not in reality, but in our reality. It's like a magnifying glass that focuses and concentrates all the brilliance of the sun onto a withered leaf of a heart and sets it ablaze. 
And before you're a Christian, you and I think small of God. I remember God was there, I believed in him, but I had small, inconsequential thoughts about God. And maybe this morning, God has little bearing in your life. You'll go on tomorrow, you'll go on in 2020, and your life is inconsequential as it relates to God's having a consequence on it. You just do whatever you want in your way because you are God, you are the one that is great, you are the one that is magnifying yourself and your achievements, not necessarily to others, but even just to yourself. But when God is a worshiping work in your life and Christ is born in you like he did for Mary, your gaze is enlarged and God becomes great in your eyes. You see, if you're not worshiping Christ this Christmas day, then you are worshiping someone or something because we can't do anything but be worshipers. Louis Giglio puts it in such a profound way. He says, you may not consider yourself a worshiping kind of person. Maybe you only come to Christmas services and you say, well, I'm not really the religious type, but Giglio says, you cannot help but worship something. It's what you were made to do. And should you for some reason choose not to give God what he desires, you'll worship anyway, simply exchanging the creator for something he's created. Think of it this way. Worship is our response to what we value most. Worship is about saying, this person, this thing, this experience, this whatever is what matters most to me. It's a thing of highest value in my life. That thing might be a relationship, a dream, a position, a status, something you own, a name, a job, some kind of pleasure. Whatever name you put on it, this thing is what you worship. So how do you know where and what you worship? It's easy. You simply follow the trail of your time, your affection, your energy, your money, and your allegiance. And at the end of that trail, you'll find a throne. And whatever or whomever is on that throne is what's of highest value to you. On that throne is what you worship, says Louis Giglio. And that's a challenge because we are searching for someone or something and it's either God or something he's created. And this Christmas day is a challenge and a call to say, here is God again, he rocks up again this year. Here you are again and here he is in a manger and will you magnify him? Will you go into this day and find your heart moved to worship? This is the mind-blowing wonder that Mary cannot contain, that a holy God has come to me, has come to us. And that's why Isaiah says, for to us a child is born. It is to us, we have to respond in some way. So her song is about God, but it's also about us. As personal as it is about me, Mary, it's also about us. Because she says in verse 48 of Luke 1, he has been mindful God is a mindful God. He's been mindful of the humble state of his servant. God has been mindful of me, Mary says. I'm not alone. I, we haven't been forgotten as a human race. I, I, I'm not unseen. He knows me. He sees me. He loves me. He understands me. He understands me more deeply that God would come this far to become like one of us. You too are highly favored like Mary was. And God's greatness is magnified even more when we realize that he's a God of greatness who humbled himself. Yes, he would have remained great and we would have worshiped him for his greatness, but his greatness is now staggering because what other God would willingly give up those rights and privileges to come here and to die on a cruel cross? That elevates and magnifies his greatness even more. And there's mystery as well. Mary's a nobody in the world's eyes that God would be mindful of her humble estate. She's from a place called Nazareth that people at the time saw as the backwaters, a forgotten place, and he meets Mary there. That's what's so staggering, that God would come to Mary and to you, and for me, personally, staggering that God would come to me. But God always comes to those who recognize their need. He comes to those who recognize they can't earn God's favor. God didn't come for religious people because you know why religious people are arrogant, they're judgmental, they think they've got it all together, they think they're better than other people, they're patting themselves on the back and judging the world because religious people are healthy so they don't recognize that they need a doctor and that's why Jesus reserved his harshest words for those who were religious but didn't truly know him or recognize him. Jesus has always come for those who recognize that they have a need, to those who recognize I have a rotten disease, where is the cure, give me the cure. If you don't believe you need to be saved, you don't need a savior. If you don't believe there's something wrong, you won't take the cure. 
That is the way God always works. And Mary realizes this. She says, God has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. Those who are arrogant and proud, maybe not even outwardly, but in their inmost thoughts, that's who God scatters. It's, it's counterintuitive. God brings down rulers, those who assert their authority and rule and dictate. God brings them down in time and takes them to the grave. But he lifts up the humble. Mary's thinking, me? Lifting me up? Mary says, he's filled the hungry with good things, but he sends the rich away empty. It's the self-sufficient who are not hungry that don't need a savior. And if you come hungry this Christmas, open wide your mouth and God will fill it with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And on this Christmas morning, I'm here to tell you that God has noticed you. I have no other message than what I'm sharing with you. I have no other hope. There's nothing else that I can tell you other than God with us. He has come. You're not alone. And like Mary, won't you cry out, why me? Why me? Lord, I know my own heart. I know my own fickleness. I know the hypocrisy in my heart that you don't see. I know my self-sufficiency at times. I know my sin. I know my weakness, my coldness of heart. But the irony is that a proud person cries out, why me, when they face suffering? I've lived a good life, I don't deserve this. Who's this God that he would do this to me? Why me, I don't deserve this. But I wanna tell you the humble worshiper cries out, why me, when they experience grace and favor and a beating heart and breath in their lungs. They say, why me, because we don't deserve that. Why should Emmanuel come to me? And so will you come this morning, this Christmas morning again, and just bow, fall to your knees, repenting of self-sufficiency and cling to Christ alone? Christ, the one your soul has been searching for, will you allow Christ to be born in you? I wanna close with this beautiful story. It comes from Dr. Maxwell Maltz. It's in his autobiography that he wrote in the 50s. Dr. Maxwell Maltz was a, a famous plastic surgeon of the time. And in his autobiography, he tells this true story of a lady that came to see him at his practice one day. She had a husband, and this husband had being completely burned and disfigured in a fire. Basically, his parents had been, I think it was in one side of the house, and this raging fire had broken out, and uh, their son had tried to get to them, try to rescue them, it was just impossible, and sadly, his parents perished in the fire, and in the process, he was just very badly disfigured, and he felt so shameful about it, he mistakenly thought God had punished him, because he hadn't been good enough to save them, and this is what he, it would be his lot in life for the rest of his life, to live with these scars. And so he actually locked himself away. He didn't even want his own wife to see him, and he just became this recluse. And so his wife went to Dr. Maxwell Maltz to ask him for help, and he said to her, Madam, I can restore your husband's face. But the wife knew that her husband had repeatedly refused help again and again. He had a hard heart, even though she had tried and reached out to him in love. Uh, he had just shut her out. He, he, just, he just lived alone in his own world. So why on earth did she visit the surgeon if she knew that her husband wouldn't be open? Well, this is what she said to Dr. Maltz. Doctor, I want you to disfigure my face so that I can be like him. If I can share in his pain, then maybe, just maybe he'll let me back into his life. And Dr. Maltz was obviously shocked. Being a good doctor, he obviously point blank refused to disfigure this lady's face, but he was so moved by the love she had for her husband, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll come to your home and see if I can't reach out to him. And so he came to their home and he knocked on the man's door. He said, excuse me, sir, I'm a plastic surgeon. Uh, if you're open to it, I can restore your face. And there was no response from that closed door. And again, he called out and said, please, sir, come out. But there was no response. His heart was hard. And then still speaking through the door, Dr. Maltz said, sir, can I tell you about your wife's proposal? She's just come to me and she's asked me to dis disfigure her face in the hopes that if she can be like you and share in your pain, that you might somehow find it in your heart to let her back into your life. That's how much she loves you. And there was a brief moment of silence. And then Dr. Maltz says, the doorknob slowly began to turn. And friends, God comes near to you again this Christmas. Here we are, in love, as a baby born in Bethlehem. But this baby, this beautiful baby with beautiful skin and this, this just this 
wonderful little life we know grows up and gets nailed to a cross and his face is marred and disfigured. He's a chunk of flesh bleeding on a cross, beaten and bruised with thorns and blood. And he did that because he loves you. I don't know why. No preacher can ever explain the why to you, but somehow he does and his mercy, in the midst of his holiness, he makes a way to come. And this morning again, he knocks on the door of your heart. He knows that heart is hard. He knows that heart is resisted. But he wants you to know that he loves you and you are not alone. He's the love that you've been searching for. And the question I have as we close is will you open the door to Emmanuel, God with us? That's up to you this morning. It's not up to me. That's up to you. Let's pray together. Oh Lord Jesus, we come and we fall on our knees in worship because there is mystery here that we will not fully understand. There is grace that is so deep that we haven't even plumbed its depths. Lord, we continue to minimize our sin and think that we're better than we really are. We continue to pull you down and make you small. Oh Lord, you are far greater than what we recognize and Lord, our sin has, has been more of an offense to you than we have ever given it credit for because it's not an offense to us, it's not an offense to our friends unless we're really, really bad. Lord, it's an offense to you because you are uncontaminated. You see our thought life, our motives, and yet you would come. That while we were still sinners, Christ would die for us. Oh Lord, this is good news. There is no other God who has come this far, not just to be a, a model to us, but a God who's actually come to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. You've come and rescued us. You've come near. A God who's only compassionate from a distance is not a true God of compassion, but Lord, your compassion has brought you close. And yet, Lord, your distance has enabled you to also save us and take us out of the burning blaze. And in the process, Lord, you have been disfigured. And Lord, as we look into your face and we see your nail-pierced hands and we see your scars, Lord, we just bow in reverence and we thank you for a love that reconciles us to the Father, a reconciling love that perhaps we have not even been looking for actively, but we've just been filling our lives with other lesser some things and other less is someone's. Cheap God substitutes that we know leave us empty after a while. The presence that we open will wear off in the joy that they can bring. But the life-giving presence of the Lord Jesus Christ remains ever-present in our lives. 